Then Morgoth cursed Turin and Morwen and their offspring, and set a doom upon them of darkness and sorrow. And taking Hurin from prison, he set him in a chair of stone upon a high place of Thangaradrim. There he was bound by the power of Morgoth, and Morgoth, standing beside him, cursed him again. And he said, Sit now there and look upon the lands where evil and despair shall come upon those whom thou lovest. Thou hast dared to mock me and to question the power of Melkor, master of the fates of Arda. Therefore with my eyes thou shalt see, and with my ears thou shalt hear. And never shall thou move from the place, this place, until all is fulfilled unto its bitter end. Hey there, gang. I'm Danny J. And I'm Joel N. And we are... Keep on talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you guys doing? Hope this finds everybody well. The, uh, you know, things are tense in the world right now, and hopefully we can get a get a few laughs together. Get a little reprieve. Yeah. Dive into some Tolkien. So let's talk about Doom. <laughs> yeah, guys. We're, we're excited because today is the final episode in our Doom trilogy. Yes, yes, yes. Doom, 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 doom. So if you guys recall, we've been covering uh, Tolkien's concept of Doom, and we kind of decided to split it up into three categories. Oaths, prophecies, and curses. Of course. Each of these affects or guides Doom of the characters in some way, and uh, you might consider it a paradigm shift in the song you know the song but like we mentioned today is part three where we are going to cover curses curses curse you and this is going to be a fun one guys tolkien has some really fun curses let's define a curse real quick and uh this is from oxford english dictionary it is a solemn utterance intended to invoke a supernatural power to inflict harm or punishment on someone or something yeah curses they tend to have a pretty strong effect on doom the uh, curses can dictate someone's doom quite literally but not always and uh, curses can affect someone's personal doom doom or it can affect the doom of an entire population and curses can almost have as great of an effect as prophecies do yeah as kind we of learned a negative th- prophecy in a way right yeah as we learned in the last episode prophecies are huge and they can affect huge swaths of people curses not quite as much but similarly they do affect large numbers of people sometimes and we see this play out famously on several occasions throughout tolkien and in today's list we're going to cover some of the major curses that are the driving forces in the throughout much of tolkien's legendarium hell yeah guys buckle your seatbelts. yeah 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 so let's go in chronological order let's start off with the first stage so right off the bat since we're talking about curses today some right. of you will probably be thinking of the uh, Doom of yeah. Mandos, like one of the greatest curses known. Sure. And we kind of, so uh, many consider the Doom of Mandos to be a curse, um, and it is referred to as a curse in the text. And other names for it were the Doom of the Noldor, the Curse of Mandos, or the Prophecy of the North. Right. So when we came up with this list, oaths, prophecies, and curses, we had to kind of debate in which episode we were going to cover the Doom of Mandos. Yeah. But uh, we decided it was a little more appropriate to cover the Doom of Mandos in our previous episode, Prophecies. So if you want more on that... Go back to Prophecies. Go back, yeah, go back to episode 59. And furthermore, prophecies. why are you listening to part three of a three-part trilogy? That's kind of strange. Yeah, if you, strange. Haven't li- if you haven't listened to that last one, geez, guys, what are you doing? Yeah, come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but the first curse on our list today is going to be the curse of uh, Aeol when he curses his son Maglin. Right. So who is this this uh, g- curse concerning? Of course, that is Aeol, the dark elf of Nan Elmoth, cursing his son Maglin, like we just said, right? Yeah, and to give full context on this curse, we kind of need to uh, rewind the clocks a little bit and start the story off with Eredel the White. Yes, indeed, Eredel the White. She is a uh, sister to High King Turgon of Gondolin. She was really precious to Turgon as well, and she originally dwelt with him in uh, Gondolin. Yeah, and she was also... A very good huntress, and she was fond of riding in the forests. And after staying in Gondolin for 200 years, because, oh, as, as we know, Gondolin has that rule. You can't, can't leave, leave 
Uh, she yearned for the forest, and she wanted to go hunting with her buddies, Caligorm and Cooperfin. So God, God knows fucking why. Yeah, I don't know. They're kind of assholes, but I mean, they're they're known to be hunters, so yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. Whatever. Your, your hunting buddies aren't necessarily your best friends, right? <laughs> but Aridel, she goes and asks King, King Turgon for his permission to leave the city, which is highly irregular because, you know, it's his law that no one can do that. Yeah, and he allowed her to leave, but under the following conditions. First, she had to have an entourage for her safety. And secondly, she could only go to see her brother Fingon. She couldn't, he didn't want her to go anywhere else. He wanted to keep this on the DL. Yeah. And of course, Aridel is a, uh, a great huntress and rider. So she immediately gives the entourage a slip and sneaks off on her own. Yeah. She actually has some pretty terrifying adventures where she has to pass the uh, mountains of terror, right? There's, she, she gets into all kinds of wanderings that I literally had to beat myself with a stick to cut out of this outline. Cause yeah, because there's some long. terrifying shit that happens. <laughs> but basically, after many wanderings, she ends up wandering into the forest of Nan Elmoth, which is a small forest. I think it's just uh, east of Doriath, right? Right. Or northeast. Northeast. Italy, but it's yeah. known for having a very tall, dark trees. And um, so she's like, uh, so captured, I would say. I, I'd say She's so. She's bewitched into like losing her way into this place and then is forcibly wed by known asshole Ale the Dark Elf. Ale the Dark Elf. And this happened, of course, in First Age 316. Yeah, in four no, years... John 316. <laughs> in, uh, th- in about four years later, in First Age 320, she bears Ale's son, and they name him Maglin. Maglin. And this is essentially the essence of the curse we're getting at now. Right. So long story short, so Maglin grows up to kind of hate his father. His father is very controlling. He doesn't want them to leave the forest of Nan Elmoth or do anything Yeah, fun. he's just a dick. He's just really a dick. And Aridel and Maglin ultimately come up with a plan to run away from him and go back to Gondolin because Maglin has heard all these great stories from his mom about how great Gondolin is, and he's like, I want to go there. Yeah, she missed it a lot, so she would talk about it a lot. Mm-hmm. So in the year 400, they do that, and they go to Gondolin. They dip out one day while uh, Aeol is away from home. But ultimately, he finds out that they had left, and Aeol follows them. Wouldn't you know it? Without their knowledge, and Aeol makes his way all the way to the secret tunnel that is the entrance to Gondolin. No one's supposed to be able to find this, but naturally, Aridel knows where it is. Right, and once they're in, once he's in the tunnel, he's immediately captured, <laughs> and he's taken before High King Turgon for judgment. And we got Joel reading an excerpt about this scene here. And so Aeol was brought to Turgon's hall and stood before the high seat, proud and sullen. But Turgon treated him with honor and rose up and would take his hand. And he said, Welcome, kinsman, for so I hold you. Here you shall dwell at your pleasure, save only that you must here abide and depart not from my kingdom. For it is my law that none who finds the way hither shall depart. But Aeol withdrew his hand. I acknowledge not your law he said. No right have you or any of your kin in this land to seize realms or to set bounds, either here or there. This is the land of the Teleri, to which you bring war war and all unquiet, dealing ever proudly and unjustly. I care nothing for your secrets, and I came not to spy upon you, but to claim my own, my wife and my son. Yet, if Aridel, your sister, you have some claim, then let her remain." Let the bird go back to the cage, where soon she will sicken again, as she sickened before. But not so, Maglin. My son, you shall not withhold from me. Come, Maglin, son of Aeol, your father commands you. Leave the house of his enemies and slayers of his kin, or be accursed. But Maglin answered nothing. That's right. Leave the slayers of thy kin, or be accursed. That's right. Now we're getting into the curse. So naturally, you know, Ailes, uh he's an asshole and he just doesn't want to be here. He wants to leave. Mm-hmm. And he gets enraged by the fact that Mails, uh, Meglin says nothing. Yeah, he wanted his son to, you know, go with him and maybe defend him. So he gets so upset that he basically is like, all right, fine then, you know, fuck all this. And he throws a spear at Maglin, trying to take him out. I think he says something like, fine, if if, I, if we can't leave, then I choose death for me and my son also, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, some, some crazy man some shit. Some stupid shit. And but then, yeah, he chucks the spear, but uh, wouldn't you know it, Aridel, being uh, an awesome mom, steps in front of that shit and takes it. Ugh! 
And unfortunately, that spear was poisoned because Aeol is a bitch. Yes. And so later that night, Aerodel dies. Of course. And Aeol, he was brought before Turgon, who was fucking, uh, fucking rightfully furious. Yeah, he just killed his sister. Yeah. So Turgon sentences Aeol to death by being thrown from a precipice on Gondolin. But before they eat him, he gets a little <laughs> more specific with his curse on Maglin. And we've got an excerpt here read by Danny about this. Therefore, when Aeol was brought before Turgon, he found no mercy. And they led him forth to the Karagdur, a precipice of black rock upon the north side of the hill of Gondolin, there to cast him down from the sheer walls of the city. And Maglin stood by and said nothing. But at the last, Aeol cried out, So you forsake your father and his kin, ill-gotten son. Here shall you fail of all your hopes, and here may you yet die the same death as I. Then they cast Aeol over the Karagdur, and so he ended, and to all in, John- in Gondolin it seemed just. <laughs> I love that last line. Yeah. And it to, seemed just. That's it like, seemed just. We, that, that cracked our book club up. Like, we're nerds, but like that that, that was like so fucking funny. Yeah, it's like us. the whole city was like, oh yeah, he was an asshole. <laughs> he died, or whatever. And to all, it seemed just. It seemed just. That's like one of those things where you just do this afterwards, you know? Yeah, wipe just my hands. <laughs> wipe this. your hands of this. So let's talk a little bit about the fulfillment of this curse now that this curse has been officially made. So as we all know, Maglin goes on to become the greatest traitor in pretty much all of Tolkien. Yeah, I can't think of another one. More of a Benedict Arnold than this guy. He's quite the fucking uh, Judas. Yeah, he is the Judas Iscariot of this tale. Et tu, Brute. Yeah, all these famous traitors we're bringing up. (laughs) Yeah, so Maglin eventually ignores Turgon's orders not to leave the encircling mountains around Gondolin, the Akoriath. Mm -hmm. And he leaves because he wants to go look for ore. He was quite the miner like his father. Yeah, he was actually, when I was doing research, I didn't realize how big of a role as a smith he had. He was big in the city as a smith, yeah. And according to one of my favorite uh, uh, Lord of the Rings TikTokers, he may have very well been the person who made the three gondolindrum blades. Oh, no way. Yeah, I, I never, never really made that. that connection. That's a great Tolkienian connection. Very interesting. Because he was one of the greatest smiths in the city at the time. He taught mm-hmm. them much, and they taught him stuff as well. That's a that's a fun that's a fun fact to think about. Yeah, I think his name was uh, No Better Do Better or something like that. It's a great. He's a great. Check him out. Yeah, go check out his TikToks. So Maglin eventually ignores Turgon's orders not to leave the encircling mountains, the Akoriath. And he leaves looking for some ore in the mountains because he's quite the smith. And while he's out, he's captured by orcs and brought back to Angband. And there, of course, he betrays Gondolin for lordship of the city in the hand of his cousin, Idril. Yeah, Morgoth questions him looking for the location of Gondolin. He's like, if you tell me where it is, I'll let you marry your fucking cousin, cousin you sicko yeah. and, and i'll give be you puppet ruler of the city yeah and i'll give you lordship over the city dirty 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 and meglin's like all right oh yeah why would you want to like have a city full of orcs or what orcs and slaves like that's fucking stupid but he goes for it nonetheless and he betrays it and gondolin falls to morgoth's army and during the fall of gondolin meglin tries to kill tuor and idril's son aorendil and he tries to forcibly take idril his wife yeah gross right but Tour finally catches up with the dude, and they duke it out on the top of the walls of the city, which I imagine was a hell of a fight. And Tour bests Maglin and throws his ass from the top of the wall. I think it was the same area where his father was condemned to death, wasn't it? Um, It doesn't specifically say that, but it uh, I don't know if it was the Karagdur itself, okay. but it was definitely from the precipice. But he was still thrown from the walls of yeah. Gondolin. And that ultimately fulfilling the curse that he should die the same way as his father. Yeah, and it specifically says that he smote the wall thrice on his way down into the flames. Yeah, Tolkien really wanted to give the reader satisfaction that this asshole got what was coming to him. He finally got what was coming to him. He hit that wall three times on his way down. uh, 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 And then, uh, yeah. Into the the flames. Yeah, Yeah, so that was, uh, that's that's essentially the fulfillment of the curse on Maglin by his father, Aeol. Yeah, fuck Maglin. To his own death. So I totally have father. this. I've I've had a, like a, a visual cinematic fantasy of this moment, and it bakes in one of my theories. So like he's trying to kill a Rendell on the wall, right? Sure. And he's got him like like uh, you know knife to the throat or something. Knife to the throat or something. But what does a Rendell do? But reach down 
and pull out Sting, dude. Oh, shit. Because it's his blade, remember? Okay. And then he, like, slashes Meglin or whatever on the leg, and then he's like, oh, and then Tour just picks him up. See you later, son. Whew. You know, that's actually a pretty good, that'd be a good scene. That's what I'm saying. That'd be a pretty good I'm scene. I'm an artist. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm an artist. This is what I do. All right, let's get back to it, guys. The next curse on the list, the curse of Anglical slash Gurthang. Yes, and this is a curse that we've kind of mentioned in the last episode uh, when we talked about some of the prophecies of Melian. Mm-hmm. So the curse of uh, Anglical, or also known as Gurthang, is a curse concerning the Black Sword that we know as Anglical, later renamed as Gurthang, famously welded by Turin Turinvar. Yes. Wielded, rather. And it is only the um, it's the only sentient speaking sword that we know of in Turk in uh, Tolkien. Yeah, and I think that's a big part of the reason why we consider this weapon cursed. It has some weird. It's got some weird qualities. Weird qualities that are attributed to its maker, Aeol. Yeah. Yep. A lot of folks consider this uh, sword kind of tied in with the children of Hurin, but we we kind of figured that this curse originated outside of the children of Hurin. It's yeah. kind of its own thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely synergetic with the curse of House of Ador. It works together with it, gives it a little flavor, but it's not, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's own, not of that curse. Yeah, it's its own thing. So Anglical was one of two swords made by Aeol the Dark Elf that uh, were made from a special black metal that came from a meteorite. Uh, the other of the two swords was named Angriel, and this was stolen by his son Maglin and taken with him to Gondolin. And I assume taken with uh, his dumbass down into the flames. Yeah, we can assume <laughs> that he had it on him when he fell off the precipice, as we just talked about. But in the year 487 of the First Age, first age uh, a good character that we know and love, Beleg Kuthalion of Doriath. Love him. He goes to King Thingol and he asks him for permission to leave the kingdom to go live with another character we love, Turin Turambar, to, to go protect him. And uh, Turin was currently living in the wild with a band of outlaws. Yeah, that's kind of why he wanted to go leave with him. Yeah, and Beleg asks the king for a sword of worth to take on his mission. The King Thingol gives Beleg permission to take any sword in his armory other than his own sword. Aaron Ruth. Aaron Ruth. And as we know, Beleg chooses. Anglical, the Black Blade. And Melian famously prophesizes about the curse on this blade. See our last episode, episode 59. By the way, this is episode 60, guys. Woo, 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 woo. Woo. Here's an excerpt from Joel about that. There is malice in this sword. The dark heart of the smith still dwells in it. It will not love the hand it serves. Neither will it abide with you long. And like most things that Melian says, it's just completely fucking ignored. <laughs> yeah, and Beleg takes the sword anyway. I don't know why everyone fucking ignores Melian. Her advice is something you should listen to. Yes, always. L much like Rodney Dangerfield, we talked about in the previous uh, <laughs> episodes, she get no respect. <laughs> no respect. So fulfillment of this curse, the, the curse on this sword. So there's actually kind of a lot that happens due to this sword being a cursed blade. Yeah. So first, the sword pricks Turin's foot in a panic, and he kills his best friend, Beleg. Uh, the sword also dulls after the death of its previous owner, Beleg. The sword breaks slash commits suicide, question mark, when Turin uses it to kill himself. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, the sword also speaks, which is the only time we know of any sword speaking. Yeah, and but it speaks at the right moment for sure. It does, yeah. And we've got an excerpt here about this scene. Hail, Gurthang, no lord or loyalty dost thou know, save the hand that wieldeth thee. From no blood wilt thou shrink. Wilt thou therefore take Turum Turumbar? Wilt thou slay me swiftly? And from the blade rang a cold voice in answer, Yea, I will drink thy blood gladly, that I may forget the blood of Beleg, my master, and the blood of Brandy is slain unjustly. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I, I would consider that blade cursed if it spoke to me like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that's also the end of that blade when uh, Turin commits suicide with it. Yeah, they leave it in the in the grave with him. Yeah, they say it's strange that the sword broke like that because it shouldn't. It was a particularly strong yeah. and sharp sword, so it's almost as if it committed suicide. It gave up on life. But yeah, so that, that kind of covers the curse on the sword Anglical. That's a fun and interesting curse. And it kind of leads us into our next curse. And this Yeah, is, this is the meat in the pot roast right here. Yeah, this is kind of the big curse that we're going to be covering this episode. This is the big one. 
And that, of course, is the curse on the House of Hador. Also known as the curse on the children of Hurin. Yes. So who is this? But it, it affects more than the children. Oh, yes. It affects <laughs> a whole a great deal of things. Um, so who is this one concerning, of course? This is Morgoth's curse on Hurin and his family, which you'll recognize from the opening excerpt. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is probably the most famous, and, or I should say infamous, and most tragic curse that we know of in Tolkien. Yeah, if you don't really count the Doom of Mandos, because that again. was... Yeah, again. Again, we covered That's that... That's the outlier. We covered that in Prophecies. I know it's also technically a curse, but this but yeah. episode, this is the big curse we're covering. Right. Yeah, and like we mentioned, it's essentially the story of the children of Hurin. So, some context for this curse, because this is a big one. Yes. So, when this era takes place, there are many men living in the regions of Hithlum and Dor Loman. And this is where Hurin Thalion, Hurin the Steadfast of the House of Hador, and his family live. And in the year 472 of the First, of the, uh, first Age, Hurin leaves Dor Loman to join a massive assault that's being planned on Morgoth. And we know this as the Union of Maedros. And when he leaves to go join the Union of Maedros, he is never seen again by any of his friends or family. Just like the rest of the men of Dorn Loman. They literally... Yes. Yeah. yeah, all the men all the men that leave to go fight with the Union of Maedros, none killed. of them come back. Yeah. So during the assault on Morgoth, the tables turn on the Union of Maedros, and it becomes the single greatest loss that the free peoples of Middle-earth ever experience in any age ever. Ever, ever, ever. <laughs> and this becomes known as the Nirnaith Arnoidiad, the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. Yeah, like we said, it's an absolute slaughter. None of the men of Dor Loman return. And from this point on, Norgoth, Morgoth essentially rules the entire, um, like, at least the northern part of Beleriand and Hithlum. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he basically rules a large swath of Middle-earth. Yeah, and that's uh, pretty much till the end of the First Age. Yeah. He, yeah, this is a, this is a, we described it as the beginning of the Dark Ages. Oh really. yeah, it's the worst part of of the first of age. the Legendarium to live, I think. So the curse itself. So in the aftermath of the Near Nath Arnordiad, Hurin is the only one left alive of the men of Dorloman. There's a cool scene where it talks about him like standing there, like swinging an axe or a, 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 a troll axe, like yeah. cutting off arms from orcs that are trying yeah, to grab him. arms literally and... clutched onto him, like, severed off. Yeah, it's it's pretty metal. That'd be a hell of a cosplay. You could have, like, fucking, like, orc arms, like, attached to you, your Hurin, you know? Yeah, I wonder who would get that. Yeah, I would get it. I, immediately, <laughs> if I saw a bunch of orc arms and, like, a withered-ass troll axe, I'd be yeah. like, that's fucking Hurin. That's Hurin. Hurin Thalion right there. But the reason that they were all just grabbing him is because Morgoth gave his forces an order to capture Hurin alive. And that's because Morgoth knows that Hurin Hurin has some information that he wants. It turns out, as we know, Morgoth needs to fucking know where Gondolin is. Yeah, and that's because that's where the current High King, High King Turgon, is hiding. And Morgoth's main purpose is to eliminate the High King of the Noldor. He hates the Noldor. Yeah, and he hated it. Well, because well, furthermore, the, uh, the Gondolindrum showed up when they... Um, weren't unlooked for. Yeah, they did sort of foil his plans a little bit. Yeah, I mean, he still won in the end, but... But, like, the men of Dor Loman all were slaughtered, letting them retreat back to Gondolin, essentially. Yeah, they kind of gave themselves up in order to save the Gondolindrum. So, Morgoth is hell-bent on finding Gondolin. Yes, dude. And he knows that Hurin had been there at one point. So, Hurin is taken to Morgoth for questioning... But he's uncooperative, and he mocks Morgoth. And this is when Morgoth curses Hurin and his family. We got Joel to read. Uh, this is similar to the opening excerpt, but this is from a different... Uh, this is from the Children of Hurin novel, so it's going to be a little extended, guys. Therefore, Hurin was brought before Morgoth. For Morgoth knew by his arts and his spies that Hurin had the friendship of the king, and he sought to daunt him with his eyes. But Hurin could not be daunted, and he mocked Morgoth, saying, Blind you are, Morgoth Bauglier, and blind shall ever be, seeing only the dark. You know not what rules the hearts of men, and if you knew, you could not give it. But a fool is he who accepts what Morgoth offers. You will take first the price, and then withhold the promise, and I should get only death if I told you what you ask." Then Morgoth bade Hurin look westward towards Hithlum, and think of his wife and his son and other kin. For they dwell now in my realm, said Morgoth, 
and they are at my mercy. You have none, answered Hurin, but you will not come at Turgon through them, for they do not know his secrets. Then wrath mastered Morgoth, and he said, Yet I may come at you and all your accursed house, and you shall be broken on my will, though you all were made of steel. Then Morgoth, stretching out his long arms toward Dorloman, cursed Hurin and Morwen and their offspring, saying, Behold, the shadow of my thought shall lie upon them wherever they go, and my hate shall pursue them to the ends of the world. And taking Hurin back to Angban, he set him in a chair of stone upon a high place of Thangorodrim, from which he could see afar the land of Hithlam in the west, and the lands of Beleriand in the south. There he was bound by the power of Morgoth, and Morgoth, standing beside him, cursed him again, and set his power upon him so that he could not move from that place, nor die until Morgoth should release him. Sit now there, said Morgoth, and look out upon the lands where evil and despair shall come upon those come upon those whom you have delivered to me. For you have dared to mock me, and have questioned the power of Melkor, master of the fates of Arda. Therefore with my eyes you shall see, and with my ears you shall hear, and nothing shall be hidden from you. Ooh, spooky. So, you know, we got to do it, guys. Let's get into the fulfillment of this one. Yeah, so what results is basically Tolkien's most tragic tale, the children of Hurin from the First Age. And we're not going to go too much into the totality of the story. We're going to speed around it. Yeah, we're not going to talk specifically about the life of Turin Turambar and his sister Neonor. For more on that, you can go back and reference our episodes 11 and 12 for Turin Turambar. Of course, of course. So, ultimately, the curse haunts the two siblings their entire lives. Turin accidentally kills an elf in Doriath and has to flee into the wild, fearing punishment and shame. Turin also accidentally kills his best friend with the cursed sword we talked about previously, Anglekel. Yep. Turin mistakenly places his, his mistakenly placed pride leads to the destruction of the kingdom of Nargothron by the dragon Glaurung. Turin's mother Morwen and sister Neonor also just happened to have been coming to Nargothrond looking for him at the time that the dragon was sacking the place. So they run into the dragon Glaurung and he curses Neonor causing her to have amnesia. Basically she forgets who she is. Right. And then Morwen flees into the wild and is fucking lost. And Turin is also cursed by Glaurung to go run aimlessly back to his homeland of Dorloman, way, up, way, way, way up in the north, which ultimately dooms another character, Finduilas, to death. When Turin reaches his homeland, he finds that his people are all enslaved by Easterlings. He then has a literal tantrum and makes things even worse for his people. Yeah, it's just everywhere he goes, things get worse and worse and worse. Yeah, he tries to kind of start a revolution, and then they're like, this isn't going to work, you should just This is going to make things worse for us, and it does. And it does. It's really sad. So after that, Turin flees back south to the forest of Brethel, and he basically figures there he can just kind of hide out and hide from his doom and this curse. But he, while yeah, there... He, he, yeah, he, well, he names himself Master of Doom at this point. Too, yeah, this right? is when he gives himself that name. Yep. But of course, yeah, he uh, ends up marrying his sister, ends Neonor. Up, ends up marrying Neonor. Really, really tragic. And they get married and live happy lives as a married couple for years, right? Like two years or so, yeah. Yeah, until the dragon Glaurung comes and lifts the curse, revealing to both of them that the happiest years of their lives so far were actually an incestuous curse. Oh, and she was also with child. She was also out. with child, even worse. Like, even they thought worse. that was such a point of happiness, and now they know it's just terrible. So, of course, Neonor, knowing all this now, she unalives herself by jumping off a cliff into the river Taglin, and Turin unalives himself by falling on his own sword. And that is the end of the story of the children of Hurin, but that is by no means the end of this curse. Oh no, boy! It's got a little. It's got a few more tragedies yeah. in it yet. So that was our our speed run. <laughs> that was us getting through. That was just the best we could do. The meat of the story of the children of Hurin, so we can get to what else happens. So keep in mind, as part of Morgoth's curse, Hurin was also forced to watch all of this happen to his children. 
Yeah, and after the death of his family, Huron is released from his imprisonment at Angband, but not free from the curse. No, like we said, this curse just continues on. It was on him and his family. So we've got a uh, excerpt here about what happens next from Danny. So ended the tale of Turin Turambar, but Morgoth did not sleep nor rest from evil, and his dealings with the House of Hador were not yet ended. Against them his malice was unsated, though Hurin was under his eye and Morwen wandered distraught in the wild. Unhappy was the lot of Hurin. When therefore Morgoth judged the time to be ripe, he released Hurin from his bondage, bidding him to go whether he would, and he feigned that it was he who was moved to pity for an enemy utterly defeated. But he lied, for his purpose was that Hurin should still further his hatred for the elves and men ere he died. Tragic. Yeah, he's still using this guy. Hasn't he been through enough? Yeah, he's still using this guy, even at this point. So after his release from Angband, Hurin travels back south towards Bretho, the last place he knew his children to be. Uh, on his way south, this is when he stops uh, somewhat near the Crusagrim, the encircling mountains near Gondolin, because he kind of knows generally that's the where general it is. The general area of where. Yeah, and he has kind of a breakdown, and he's yelling for help from King Turgon. He's trying to get King Turgon's attention. He's just aimlessly yelling Turgon. into the mountains. Turgon, hear me, Turgon. But this is of no avail to him. There's no answer. But there were spies around, and this is ultimately what reveals the location of Gondolin to Morgoth's spies. Whoops. So after getting no response from Turgon, Hurin continues south to the forest of Brethil, and he stops at the gravestone of his children. And while there, he meets his long-been-missing uh, wife one last time before she dies. And Joel's going to read a little bit from the, the Silmarillion of the Ruin of Doriath. He came at last to the place of the burning of Glaurung, and saw the tall stone standing near the brink of Kabad Ne'er Amoth, but Hurin did not look at the stone, for he knew what was written there, and his eyes had seen that he was not alone. Sitting in the shadow of the stone, there was a woman, bent over her knees, and as Hurin stood there, silent, she cast back her tattered hood and lifted her face. Gray she was and old, but suddenly her eyes looked into his, and he knew her, for though they were wild and full of fear, that light still gleamed in them that long ago had earned for her the name Eledwen, proudest and most beautiful of mortal women in the days of old. You come at last, she said. I have waited too long. It was a dark road. I have come as I could, he answered. But you are too late, said Morwen. They are lost. I know it, he said. But you are not. But Morwen said, Almost, I am spent, I shall go with the sun. Now little time is left, if you know, tell me. How did she find him? But Hurin did not answer, and they sat beside the stone and did not speak again. And when the sun went down, Morwen sighed and clasped his hand and was still. And Hurin knew that she had died. And he looked down at her in the twilight, and it seemed to him that the lines of grief and cruel hardship were smoothed away. She was not conquered, he said. And he closed her eyes and sat unmoving beside her as the night drew down. Damn, yo. She was not conquered, yo. Yeah, it's, just, it's also just tragic that the best solace he could get was knowing that his wife died Did, without without knowing. the knowledge that his siblings had an incest that that their children had an incestuous relationship. Yeah, it is just, it is just really sad. Yeah, dude. But wait, there's more. Oh, you thought that was the end? It's you not thought that the was end. the end. What a no. fool! <laughs> How foolish of you. So after the death of his wife, Hurin travels to the ruins of Nargothrond, one of the other last places he knew his son to be. And in the hoard of the treasure left behind, Hurin finds the Nauglamir, a famously beautiful necklace made by the dwarves and gifted to the old king of Nargothrond, King Finrod Felagund. And since the death of Finrod Felagund was partially the fault of King Thingol, um, and since Hurin now uh, feels angry and bitter toward King Thingol, Hurin decides to take the Nauglamir and give it to Thingol as a sarcastic gift. Yeah, Hurin meant to sort of just, she meant it to be kind of a jab. 
at King Thingol since uh, King Thingol was originally supposed to house Huron's family, his wife and daughter and son, and now they're all dead. All of them. So we have an excerpt here about this, read by Danny. Then Hurin cast the treasure at the feet of Thingol with wild and bitter words. Receive now thy fee, he cried, for thy fair keeping, my children and my wife. For this is the Nauglamir, whose name is known to many among elves and men, and I bring it to thee out of the darkness of Nargothrond, where Finrod thy kinsman left it behind, when he sought for, for with Baron, son of Barahir, to fulfill the errand of Thingol of Doriath. At last Melian spoke and said, Hurin Thalion, Morgoth has bewitched thee, for he that seeth through Morgoth's eyes, willing or unwilling, see things all crooked. With the voice of Morgoth thou dost now abrade thy friends. After hearing the words of Melian, Hurin stood moveless, and he gazed long into the eyes of the queen, and there in Menegroth, defended still by the girdle of Melian from the darkness of the enemy, he read the truth of all that was done, and tasted at last the fullness of woe that was measured for him by Morgoth Bauglir. And he spoke no more of what was past, but stooping fill, lifted up the Nauglamir from where it lay before Thingol's chair, and gave it to him, saying, Receive now, Lord, the necklace of the dwarves, as a gift from one who has nothing, as a memorial of Hurin of Dorloman, for now my fate is fulfilled, and the purpose of Morgoth achieved." but I am now his thrall no longer. Then he turned away and passed out from the thousand caves, and all that saw them fell back before his face, and none sought to withstand him going, nor did they know whither he went. But it is said that Hurin would not live thereafter, being bereft of all purpose and desire, and cast himself at last into the western sea, and so ended the mightiest of the warriors of mortal men. And that is finally the end of the curse on the House of Hador. Yeah, dude. It is a long one, and it is tragic and very, very sad. Yeah. So now, unfortunately, we're, we, we, we have no reprieve from the children of Huron's story, because this next <laughs> curse is a curse that happens within the story about curses. Yeah, it's somewhat related to the story of the children of Huron. It, it uh, happens during that timeline, and this is, of course, we're referencing the curses surrounding Meme the Petty Dwarf. We're talking about two curses specifically. So the first one here is the curse on Meme by Beleg. And th so this one concerns Meme the Petty Dwarf and his treachery against Turin Turambar. So who's Meme? Yeah, let's just review real quick. So Meme was a member of the race called the Petty Dwarves. They may be descendants from outcasts of the great dwarven cities of long ago. But uh, Turin and his, and his band of outlaws, his men, they basically fall in with Meme by a mischance in the year 486 of the First Age. Turin and his men are climbing up the hill of Amunruth, and they encounter some small creatures carrying huge sacks of some weird shit some roots or something they're heavily encumbered yeah and they try to run uh when the men come upon them but one of them one of the men loses an arrow and it ends up hitting and killing one of the dwarves uh but two of them run off and a third one is captured and his name is meme Mim meme agrees to lead the men to his home which he now calls bar and donwaith which means the house of ransom and when they get there, this is when it, they find out that one of the arrows that was shot hit one of Meme's two sons, and the son had died. And, of, and Turin, of course, being a, a, a great dude, solemnly apologizes and swears to pay Wergild if he should ever come into wealth. And Meme accepts this lordly apology. He says it's a very dwarven-like apology. Yeah. And he lets the men use his halls as a hideout for, wasn't it like a year or a number of years? It was a long time. It was a long time. So after staying in the halls for some some uh, amount of time, Beleg Kuthalian returns from Doriath to be with Turin. And he comes with all the gifts of uh, the helm of Dorloman and yeah. the uh, the Lambus bread. Yeah, the gifts of Melian and Thingol. So he has the black sword, the helm, and some Lambus. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but uh, Meme basically hates all elves. Oh, so, especially the Sindar. Especially the Sindar. So when Beleg shows up, he really has a grudge against Beleg. He fucking hates this guy. And because he kind of uh, is, he kind of respects Turin. The closeness of Turin and Beleg pisses Mim off. Yeah, he he loves Turin. He hates Beleg. He hates that they're close. 
And he also, turns out, hated Turin's men. Yeah, and so Meme eventually betrays the men and Beleg to the orcs of Morgoth under the condition that Turin not be slain. Because like you said, we said he sort of respected the dude. But of course, when the orcs come to assail the men, most of them are outright slaughtered and Turin is taken away, captured in bonds. When Meme thinks it's safe to finally come out of hiding, when the battle subsides... Little did he know, though, he's about to be cursed. And we got Joel reading the excerpt for this one. And at length, when all was silent again, Meme crept out of the shadows of his house, and as the sun rose over the mists of Sirion, he stood beside the dead men on the hilltop. But he perceived that not all those that lay there were dead, for by one his gaze was returned, and he looked in the eyes of Beleg the elf. Then with hatred long stored, Meme stepped up to Beleg and drew forth the sword Anglicau that lay beneath the body of one that had fallen beside him. But Beleg, stumbling up, seized back the sword and thrust it at the dwarf. And Meme in terror fled wailing from the hilltop. And Beleg cried after him, The vengeance of the house of Hador will find you yet. Oh, and it will. And it will. And it will. Let's get into it. The fulfillment of this one. After the tale of Turin Turinbar had played out, and Turin had unalived himself after slaying the dragon Glaurung in the year 499 of the First Age, until that point, uh, Glaurung was uh, applying, uh, occupying Nargothrond. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, after the death of Glaurung, uh, Meme moves into Nargothrond, Felagun's old halls, and he claims all the treasure that was left over there. And he names this treasure the treasure now of the petty dwarves. Yeah. And so he's sitting pretty in Nargothrond, uh, but uh, little does he know that uh, his curse is about to bear dark fruit. Dark fruit. When in the year 500 of the First Age, Hurin Thalion is released from Angband, as we had previously talked about, and this is when he comes to Nargothrond and finds the Nauglamir, but something else happens, and we've got an excerpt about this, read by Danny from the Silmarillion. But now someone had come and stood upon the threshold, and Meme came forth and demanded to know his purpose. But Hurin said... Who are you that would hinder me from entering the house of Finrod Felagund? Then the dwarf answered, I am Meme, and before the Proud Ones came over the sea, dwarves delved the halls of Nuluk Kisdin. I have but returned to take what is mine, for I am the last of my people. Then you shall enjoy your inheritance no longer, said Turin. For I am Hurin, son of Galdor, returned out of Angband, and my son was Turin Turumbar, who you have not forgotten. And he it was that slew Glaurung the dragon, who wasted these halls where you now sit. And not unknown is it to me by whom the dragon helm of Dorloman was betrayed. Then Meme in great fear besought Hurin to take what he would, but to spare his life. But Hurin gave no heed to his prayer and slew him there before the doors of Nargothrond. Yeah, you might say Hurin was over it. Over it. Over it. He was done. He was not, after all the shit he's been through, he wasn't having it. He was like, oh, it's that little shitty dwarf that uh, caused some pain for my son. I'm just going to kill yeah. this guy real quick. You know what I was thinking of earlier? We're not even sure if Hurin is armed at this point. Like, he might have just fucking snapped his neck. That's true. That doesn't say. Yeah, he wouldn't even... What he just snapped his fucking neck? There. I don't imagine Morgoth would have uh, given him a sword when he let him yeah, go or know, anything right? like yeah. that, so... Yeah, so he's just like, when he <laughs> slew him, he literally just... <laughs> yeah, he bro- yeah, he could have just with his bare fucking hands. Yeah, snapped him over his knee, maybe? Oof. How do you kill a dwarf with your bare hands? Especially a petty dwarf. They're smaller, right? Yeah, they're they're kind of they're kind of weak, from my understanding. Yeah. <laughs> So that's kind of the uh, end of uh, that curse, the curse on Meme the Dwarf. Now let's get to the other curse regarding Meme, and that is Meme's curse on the Horde of Nargothrond, all yeah. that gold. Meme does some cursing of his own. And uh, so this is in a, actually in a different version of the story from the published Silmarillion. This uh, is from the Baron and Luthien novel of 2017. Yeah, so as we talked about earlier, that scene with Huron coming and killing Meme, it's a little different in this version, uh, but uh, in this version also includes a curse that Meme puts on this gold. So that's why we kind of threw it in here. It's interesting. Yes, it's very interesting. So this curse is concerning the Horde of Felagund and Nargothrond and Meme the Petty Dwarf, like we said, in a different version of the of the story. Right. And as we discussed, Meme 
moves into Nargothrond after it's sacked. Yeah, in this version, though, he's got a whole bunch of homies, some more petty dwarves with him, too. Yeah, so he's not the only petty dwarf. And he claims the treasure because allegedly his ancestors carved the, carved the caves of Nargothrond, also originally called Nuluk Kizdin. Nuluk Kizdin. Yeah, so he has a really, really weird obsession with this treasure. He really wants it. And so in this version, given in Baron and Luthien, actually, from the Baron and Luthien book in 2017, it kind of reintroduces the full context of the curse. Indeed. Now, Meme had found the halls and treasure of Nargothrond unguarded, and he took possession of them and sat there in joy, fingering the gold and gems and letting them run ever through his hands, and he bound them to himself with many spells. But the folk of Meme were few, and the outlaws, filled with the lust of the treasure, slew them, though Hurin would have stayed them. And at his death, Meme cursed the gold. So what happens to this cursed treasure? So in the Baron and Luthien version, um, Hurin had with him a band of outlaws that he was rolling with, and they slay all the petty dwarves and Meme. Yeah, and that's when Meme curses the gold. And after that, they go ahead and they load up the treasure and take it over to Doriath to give it to King Thingol. And Hurin takes the Nalgalmir and personally gives it to King Thingol so he can deliver that little jab that we mentioned earlier. So let's jump forward a little bit here. In the year 502, the dwarves of Nograd, at the behest of Thingol, set the Silmaril inside the Nalgalmir. Like, what the fuck? And when it's finally completed, the dwarves... Claim Thingol really has no right to the Nalgalmir, and this leads to kind of a kerfuffle, and they just claim, you know, the necklace was given to Felgund, not Thingol. Yeah, not to you, Thingol. They claim the necklace as their own, and Thingol insults them, and they slay Thingol. Yeah, ye of uncouth race, he calls them. Racist. And the dwarves, they take the Nalgalmir, they try to leave, but they're slayed by Thingol's elves, but two of the dwarves get away and they return back to Nargrod and when they get there they lie and they say that Thingol was trying to essentially rip them off and not pay them for their work on the Nauglamir. and so they lie and say King Thingol killed them instead and this makes the dwarves of Nagrod furious and of course furious dwarves they send an army to sack Managroth and this is for the first time yeah this is the first sacking because <laughs> uh, as, as a side note here the girdle of Melian was no more as she fled to Valinor after Thingol died so they sack Menegroth and make away with all of this treasure that we discussed a little bit ago is cursed due to Meme. It also includes the Nauglamir. But Baron and Luthien eventually hear of this. And Baron and his son Dior and their green elf homies hunt down and attack the dwarves at Sarn Athrod. Yeah, and Sarn Athrod is an elvish name that means the Stony Ford. Essentially, it was a ford across the river Gelion over in eastern Beleriand, near the confluence of the river Asgar. And this is when the Battle of Sarn Athrod takes place between the green elves of Osirian and the dwarves of Nagrod over this, uh, the Nauglamir and this cursed treasure that they stole. And we've got an excerpt here from the Baron and Luthien book, read by Danny. To the north of that region is a ford across the river Asgar, and that ford is named Sarn Athrod, the ford of stones. This ford the dwarves must pass ere they reach the mountain passes that lead to their homes. And there Baron fought his last fight, being warned of their approach by Melian. In that battle the green elves took the dwarves unawares as they were in the midst of their passage, laden with all their plunder. And the dwarvish chiefs were slain, and well nigh all their hosts. But Baron took the Nalglamir, the necklace of the dwarves, whereupon was hung the Silmaril. Yet Melian warned them ever of the curse that lay upon the treasure and upon the Silmaril. The treasure they had drowned indeed in the river Asgar, and named it anew Rothlorian Golden Bed. So all that cursed treasure ultimately gets dumped in the river when they're attacked, and it uh, remains there for ever. Basically. Yeah, which means, in this case, it's still under the sea. Yeah, so the cursed treasure of Sarn Othrod, as far as we know, is never touched by anyone and is still there. Now, under the sea. Watching. Waiting. Technically, this curse is still active. Burr, 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 burr. We got an active curse active here, guys. Curse. Active curse. So that curse, the curse of the treasure there, that's the last curse we have pertaining to the first stage. Now let's get into some second age stuff, some more Dun some Dunedain stuff. This one's about Isildur's curse on the on the men of Dunharrow. 
And this concerns the oath taken and broken by the men of Dunharrow. Yeah, so in the year 3320 of the Second Age, the realms of Arnor and Gondor are founded. Arnor by Elendil, Gondor by Isildur and Anarion, Elendil's sons. And when Gondor was young, Isildur made the men of Dunharrow nearby swear an oath of allegiance to Gondor. The men of Dunharrow, they had uh, worshipped and served Sauron in the past, but they swore anyway. And when the time f- to form the last alliance came, uh, Isildur calls upon them to fight with him against the forces of Sauron to overthrow Mordor once and for all. But they refuse to come forth, and Isildur is pissed. And here's Joel going to read that part for us. But the oath that they broke was to fight against Sauron, and they must fight therefore if they are to fulfill it. For at Erech there stand yet a black stone that was brought, it was said, from Numenor by Isildur. And it was set upon a hill, and upon it the king of the mountains swore allegiance to him in the beginning of the realm of Gondor. But when Sauron returned and grew in might again, Isildur summoned the men of the mountains to fulfill their oath, and they would not, for they had worshipped Sauron in the dark years. Then Isildur said to their king, Thou shalt be the last king, and if the West prove mightier than thy black master, this curse I lay upon thee and thy folk, to rest never until your oath is fulfilled, for this war will last through years uncounted, and you shall be summoned once again ere the end. And they fled before the wrath of Isildur, and did not dare to go forth to war on Sauron's part. And they hid themselves in the secret places in the mountains, and had no dealings with other men, but slowly dwindled in their barren hills. And the terror of the sleepless dead lies about the hill of Eric, and all places where that people lingered. Ooh, spooky! Spooky! Let's get into the fulfillment of this one. This one lasts for a while, this curse. Yeah, it really does. So on March 8th, Third Age 3019, the magic year. Aragorn in the Great. Third Age, yeah. dude. That's yeah. a long time. Third Age. This is a whole this is the end of the Third Age. Yeah, yeah so this oath <laughs> this curse lasted a long time. Long, long time. And so uh Aragorn and the Great Company, they uh take the pass of the dead and they reach the stone of Eric. That's on March eighth, thirty nineteen. And this is when Aragorn summons the oath breakers to finally fulfill their oath, those dirty bastards. Yeah. And come fight for him against Sauron. And as we know, they accept and they march south with Aragorn. And on March 13th, 13th, the Grey Company and the Army of the Dead assault the Corsairs of Umbar at the Gondorian part, port of Pelargir. Yeah, and the battle is rout. Uh, afterwards, Aragorn releases the dead men, and they fade away, never to be seen again, presumably Ooh, at peace. Spooky. Spooky. So they fulfill their oath, and the curse is lifted, essentially. Yeah, that one ends kind of happily, I guess. Yeah, that's kind of a positive one. Yeah, a little bit of positivity in today's episode. So that brings us uh, well into the Third Age now, so let's get into some Third Age curses. This one's fun for me, and I always remember this one because it's a badass moment in the Two Towers here. Yeah, so the next curse on our list is Aragorn's curse on any man who draws Anduril. Yeah, and so who does this concern, of course? Well, that is anyone dumb enough to touch Aragorn's sword without his permission. So you may remember back on uh, March 2nd of the year 3019 of the Third Age, this is when uh, Gandalf, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli all arrive at Meduseld for the first time. And of course, the door warden, Hama, he requests that they leave their weapons by the door. And Aragorn initially refuses to do this shit. Yeah, only when Gandalf decides that uh, he'll relinquish his sword, Glamdring, would this is the only this is finally what it took for Aragorn to relent. But he did it reluctantly. And uh, he laid the sword himself down against a wall, yep. <laughs> and he puts a curse on it, and he says, you know, there'll be a curse basically on any man who touches Anduril, and we have a excerpt about this here, read by Danny from the Two Towers. Aragorn stood a while, hesitating. It is not my will, he said, to put aside my sword or deliver Anduril into the hand of any other man. It is the will of Theoden, said Hama. Truly, said Aragorn. I would do as the master of the house bade me, were this only a woodman's cot, if I bore now any sword but Anduril. Whatever its name may be, said Hama, here you shall lay it, if you would not fight alone against all the men of Adaras. Not alone, 
said Gimli, fingering the blade of his axe and looking darkly at the guard as if he were a young tree that Gimli had a mind to fell. Not alone. Come, come, said Gandalf. We are all friends here, or should be, for the laughter of Mordor will be our only reward if we quarrel. My errand is pressing. Here at last, here at least is my sword, good Hama, good man Hama. Keep it well, Glamdring it is called, for the elves made it long ago. Now let me pass. Come, Aragorn. Slowly, Aragorn unbuckled his belt and himself set the sword up right against the wall. Here I set it, he said, but I command you not to touch it, nor permit any other man to lay hand on it. In this elvish sheath lies the blade that was broken and, shall, and has been remade again. Telcar wrought it in the, in the depths of time. Death shall come to any man that draws Elendil's sword, save Elendil's heir. The guard stepped back and looked with amazement upon Aragorn. It seems that you are come on the wings of song out of the forgotten days, he said. It shall be, Lord, as you command. Talk about a turnaround with Hama there. Yeah, Hama's a good guy. Yeah, no, it's just funny because he's at first like, I don't give a fuck what your sword's name is. <laughs> and then he's like, nah, dude, this is fucking Andrew Flame of the West. And then he's like, all right, I'm not going to touch it. No, this is some shit right out of tales. All right. So as for the fulfillment of this curse, uh, it's kind of a special thing about this curse. It's not really fulfilled. Yeah, as far as we know, it's never afflicted on anyone because nobody's dumb enough to touch Andrew ever. <laughs> Who would be that fucking, yeah, especially after that scene. Who would be dumb enough to fucking touch Aragorn's sword? Especially after Aragorn's cor- after Aragorn's curse. Hey, you'd have to be a fool, right? Yeah, so as far as we're concerned, this curse is still active. Still active. Burr, 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 burr. Beware of this curse. Beware of this curse. Don't touch Aragorn's sword. Don't touch it. So All let's right. get it. Let's get into some more curses. We got another twofer here. Yeah, so um, the next two curses that we have on the list are concerning Gollum. Gollum. So the first one is Faramir's curse on Gollum. So this one concerns Faramir, son of Denethor, and the nasty-ass creature Gollum. And uh, as you may remember, on March 8th of the year 3019 of the Third Age, this is when Faramir spares Gollum's life at the Forbidden Pool at the, uh, I think it's in the chapter, Window of the West. I think so. Yeah, and this was at the request of Frodo. And Frodo explains that Gollum is basically their guide, and Gollum is bound to him. Faramir does not like the idea of letting Gollumir, Gollum, Gollumir, who's Gollumir? Weird. Gollumir. Gollumir. Faramir does not like the idea of Gollum leading them to Cirith but he eventually lets it go, but not before laying a curse upon Gollum's ass. Joel's going to read this one. Then I say to you, said Faramir, turning to Gollum, you are under the doom of death, but while you walk with Frodo, you are safe for your part. Yet, if ever you be found by any man of Gondor astray without him, the doom shall fall, and may death find you swiftly, within Gondor or without, if you do not well serve him. That's pretty clear. Pretty clear curse there. Yeah, you better not fuck over Frodo, or uh, I doom you to death. And this one's kind of funny because there's a, there's a callback to this curse, because after Gollum abandons Frodo and Sam in Shelob's lair, Sam again recalls Faramir's curse. We got Danny reading this little quick bit for you. A little quick one. Trapped in the end, said Sam bitterly, his anger rising again above weariness and despair. Gnats in a net. May the curse of Faramir bite that golem and bite him quick. Yeah, call upon that curse. Fuck yeah, Gollum. Yeah, I remember you cursed. Yeah, and the cool thing about uh, Gollum is he's double cursed, like we mentioned. He's got two curses on him. So uh, this curse uh, essentially comes to fruition at the same time that the next curse does. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that right now. This next curse is Frodo's curse on Gollum. Yeah, and this is this concerns the curse spoken by Frodo after being assaulted by Gollum on their way up to the Crack of Doom. Yeah, so after Frodo and Sam had almost made it across the plateau of Gorgoroth, they're about to get to Mount Doom, Gollum takes them by surprise and attacks. But Frodo gets a strange burst of energy out of nowhere and throws him down. And Joel's going to read the excerpt about this little scuffle. With a violent heave, Sam rose up. At once he drew his sword, but he could do nothing. Gollum and Frodo were locked together. Gollum was tearing at his master, trying to get at the chain and the ring. But whatever dreadful paths, lonely and hungry and waterless, Gollum had trodden, they had left grievous marks on him. He was a lean, starved, haggard thing, 
all bones and tight-drawn sallow skin. Frodo flung him off and rose up quivering. Down! Down! he gasped, clutching his hand at his, ch at his breast so that beneath the cover of his leather shirt he clasped the ring. Down, you creeping thing, and out of my path. Your time is at an end. You cannot betray me or slay me now. Then suddenly Sam saw these two rivals with other vision. A crouching shape, scarcely more than the shadow of a living thing, a creature, now wholly ruined and defeated, yet filled with a hideous lust and rage. And before it stood stern, untouchable now by pity, a figure robed in white, but at its breast it held a wheel of fire, and out of the fire there spoke a commanding voice. Be gone and trouble me no more. If you touch me ever again, you shall be cast yourself into the fire of doom. The crouching shape backed away, terror in its blinking eyes, and yet at the same time, insatiable desire. Yo, I just thought of something while you were reading that. What's up? Because he's, he's like, it says he's robed in white and has a, a wheel of fire at his breast, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is Frodo using the power of the ring to curse Gollum? I wonder. I wonder. That's an intense curse. Yeah, if it's backed up by the power of the ring, That's though? incredibly powerful. Yeah. I had never thought about that. I was just thinking of that as you were reading that. I wonder. I wonder. So the fulfillment of this curse, uh, like we mentioned with the earlier curse of Faramir on Gollum, uh, they kind of come to fruition at the same time. Yep. So Sam faces Gollum after this little exchange with Frodo. Uh, Sam faces Gollum on his own, letting Frodo to continue up the mountain to finish their mission. But like Bilbo and Frodo before him, Sam spares Gollum's life and turns his back on the creature to follow Frodo. Yeah, he you know, feels pity for him. And Gollum follows, him, follows them all the way to the cracks of doom, where he bites off Frodo's finger and takes the ring. That one finger, the special finger that Sauron also lost, the one finger. Is it their middle finger, or is it their index? I always just thought it was their ring finger. I don't know. It's specifically one finger, though. I know in some images I've seen it be their middle finger, which oh, I thought no, was I think, interesting. I think uh, Gollum, when he describes Sauron's hand, says it's the ring finger. Does I he? think, if I remember right. Yeah. Either way, though. Yeah. Same as Sauron. But then, of course, he falls into the cracks of doom, Gollum. Just like Frodo said. Doom. doom. There's that word again. Doom. So much doom in this episode. And this fulfills, yeah, like we said, both the curse of Faramir and the curse of Frodo at the same time. Yeah, he falls to his death in the very fire of doom. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's a pretty gnarly twofer. Good twofer there. Let's get into the next one. This is about a guy we just recently talked about. This is Denethir, Denethor's curse on the Palantir. Yeah, this is also a pretty gnarly curse. So this curse is concerning uh, a Palantir and the death of Lord Denethor, steward of Gondor. And he, of course, is famous for his suicide during the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. See episode 57, just a few episodes ago, uh, the Lord Denethor character profile. Hell yeah. So we're going to cover a little bit of this. So on March 15th, Blinded with despair and believing Faramir to be dead, this is when Denethor has Faramir carried down to the silent street uh, to Rath Dinan, the house of the stewards, and there he's planning to hold a funeral pyre for the both. Denethor sent for, sent for wood and oil so he and Faramir could be burned like the kings of old. Bring wood and oil. Bring wood and oil. Bring wood and oil. <laughs> I love that shit. Yeah, so believing that there is no hope at all, Denethor wished to commit suicide rather than live through the current conflict with Sauron, the uh, Battle of Pelennor Fields, which was about to go down. But Denethor's planned murder-suicide was foiled by Pepin, Pippin rather, Baragund, and Gandalf. And as a lot of you may remember, this is when Pippin manages to save Faramir from the pyre by pulling him off, and Denethor is furious. Oh, yeah. But, of course, as we know, he commits suicide anyway and burns himself alive while holding the Palantir. And we've got a gnarly excerpt about this read by Danny. So, cried Denethor, thou hadst st already stolen half of my son's love. Now thou stealest the hearts of my knights also, so that they rob me wholly of my son at last. But in this, at least thou shalt not defy my will to rule my own end. Come hither, he cried to his servants. Come if you are not all recreant. 
Two of them ran up the steps to him. Swiftly, he snatched a, uh, snatched a torch from the hand of one and sprang back into the house. Before Gandalf could hinder him, he thrust the brand amid the fuel, and at once it crackled and roared into flame. Then Denethor leaped upon the high table, and standing there wreathed in fire and smoke, he took up the staff of his stewardship that lay at his feet and broke it on his knee. Casting the pieces into the blaze, he bowed and laid himself on the table, clasping the palantir in both hands upon his breast. And it was said that ever after, if any man looked into that stone, unless he had a great strength of will to turn it to other purpose, he saw only two aged hands withering in flame. Gandalf, in grief and horror, turned his face away and closed the door. For a while he stood and thought, silently there on the threshold, while those outside heard the greedy roaring of the fire within, and then Denethor gave a great cry, and afterwards spoke no more, nor was ever again seen by mortal men. Yeah, that was fucking crazy. So yeah. essentially anyone who tries to use the, that particular palantir now only sees Denethor's withered, burning hands. It's, I mean, it says unless he is someone who has strong... Strong will. Strong will. Purpose. But we don't know of anyone from our knowledge that was ever able to do that. Yeah, no. And uh, I just thought of this. This is kind of... Uh, so um, this is kind of Denethor at the last cursing the object that cursed his life. I kind of... I, I can see, yeah, it kind of yeah. is, isn't it? Because that kind of mm -hmm. ruined his fucking life. It ruined his fucking life, for using sure. Using that, because he, he wouldn't have gone totally fucking insane if he hadn't started yeah. using that shit. Curse this fucking thing. Yeah, that's crazy. So as far as we're concerned, this curse is still active. Still active. Dur, 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 beware. Don't use that stone. Beware of this curse. <laughs> All right, but now to our last curse on our list. And this one's kind of fun because it's... Might be my favorite. <laughs> it's uh, not so much a curse as it is an attempted curse. <laughs> <laughs> this is Saruman's attempted curse on the Shire right uh, during the scouring of the Shire. I suppose this is right at the end of the scouring. Mm-hmm. And he tries, 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 but he just can't. Flaccid magic. <laughs> Flaccid magic. Yeah, so on November 3rd, 3rd Age 3019, this is when the Battle of Bywater was won, and Frodo and crew, who are totally over it at this point. Totally fucking over it. Over it. They go and march up to Bag End to sort shit out with the chief. Turns out the chief ain't around, but who is? But friggin' Saruman. Yeah, it's revealed that uh, the character that they had heard of, Sharky, this guy that orchestrated this mess, they find out that Sharky is in, act, in fact uh, Saruman. Shark bait, ooh ha ha. Shark bait, ooh ha ha. Oh, shark bait, ooh ha ha. <laughs> That's all I can fucking think of when every, I see that. Yeah, word. every time I see Sharky, I just think of fucking Finding Nemo. Yep, same. Shark bait, ooh ha ha. Shark bait, ooh ha ha. So yeah, at this juncture, the hobbits are still armed to the teeth from the Battle of Bywater. And the crowd standing by demands that he be killed right then and there. But of course, he says that if they slay him, he will lay a curse upon the Shire forever. And we got an excerpt about this fun stuff by Joel. Saruman laughed again. Well, I thought I. If they're such fools, I will get ahead of them and teach them a lesson. One ill turn deserves another. It would have been a sharper lesson if only you had given me a little more time and a little more men. Still, I have already done much that you will find it hard to mend or undo within your lives. And it will be pleasant to think of that and set it against my own injuries. Well, if that's what you find pleasure in, said Frodo, I pity you. It will be a pleasure of memory only, I fear. Go at once and never return. The hobbits of the village had seen Saruman come out of the huts, and at once they came crowding up to the door of Bag End. When they heard Frodo's command, they murmured angrily, Don't let him go! Kill him! He's a villain and a murderer! Kill him! Saruman looked around at their hostile faces and smiled. Kill him! he mocked. Kill him! If you think there are enough of you, my brave hobbits! He drew himself up and stared at them darkly with his black eyes. Do not think that when I lost my goods, I lost all my power. Whoever strikes me shall be accursed, and if my blood stains the Shire, it shall wither and never again be healed. The hobbits recoiled, but Frodo said, Do not believe him. He's lost all his power, save his voice that can still daunt you and deceive you, if you let it. But I will not have him slain. 
It is useless to meet revenge with revenge. It will heal nothing. Go, Saruman, by the speediest way. Yeah, Frodo, the warrior whose strength is not to fight. Yeah, right after this, I think this is when Saruman even acknowledges, like, you've grown. Yeah, he, he has a, it says he it has a mix of respect and hatred for, yeah. for Frodo, yeah. He's like, you robbed me of my revenge. Yeah, you couldn't even be <laughs> You couldn't even be upset. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, this is a fulfillment of this one. There's no curse to fulfill, lols. Lol. <laughs> <laughs> no Sar- curse to fulfill. Saruman sucks. Saruman sucks. No magic left except his voice. Ha ha. Ha ha. <laughs> Instead, after insulting and berating Grima Wormtongue, Grima loses it and stabs Saruman in the back. I know he fucking, he slits his throat. Oh, did he slit his throat? In the book, yeah, he slits his throat. In oh, the movie, he stabs me. him in the back. That's my mistake. Yeah, in the movie, he stabs him in the back, but he cuts his throat in the in the book. And he dies like a shriveled little bitch. Like a shriveled up little bitch. And we so wanted to have the excerpt, guys, where he shrivels up and like turns into like this turd and dies. But we're already coming on like uh, over an hour here. So. Oh yeah, this is a long yeah. one. So we're gonna we're gonna spare you guys. But uh, that's essentially the end of our list of curses for today. Yeah, but we kind of got some uh, some final thoughts on Doom. But really, what does it all mean, guys? Yeah, so this is the end of our Doom trilogy. What what does it all mean? What did it mean? So, like we mentioned, you know, this is we decided we wanted to cover Doom in three parts, Oaths, Prophecies, and Curses, and we covered Oaths. We covered about 12 of them for you guys. Yeah, and Oaths, uh, they have a moderate effect on people's Doom, is what we're concluding, and they tend to only affect individuals or small groups of people, and Oaths, of course, can be broken. Yeah, so they're not quite as binding as some of the others, but uh, prophecies, uh, we covered about 19 of those for you guys in our last episode. Prophecies, we found, have a very, very strong effect on people's doom. Uh, Prophecies essentially dictates people's doom. Yeah. And it can affect someone's personal doom or the doom of an entire population. It it generally affects more people than, than oaths do. Yeah. And uh, curses have a very strong effect on people's doom. Almost as strong as prophecies. And it can dictate doom, dictate doom, but not always. Some curses do not come to fruition if a certain condition is not met, of course. Yeah, curses can also affect someone's personal doom or the doom of a population of people, as we've seen happen. And uh, curses can have almost as great an effect on doom as prophecies do, but not quite. They're kind of a negative prophecy. They're kind of like a negative yeah, prophecy. a negative yeah. prophecy. An anti-prophecy. <laughs> anti-prophecy. <laughs> uh, and curses, they will often seal someone's doom in a very specific way. Yeah, we find curses often seal someone's death, usually yes, in a very usually. specific way. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we, we really enjoyed going over these. Oh, and, it was so much fun. And, I mean, Tolkien also loves the use of oaths, prophecies, and curses. He just really loves doom in general within yeah. his stories and tales. And they're always driving forces throughout his tales. Always, 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 always. 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 Um, but he always doesn't clearly distinguish between them, and sometimes they kind of overlap. So we're going to get into some of those little overlaps here to conclude yeah. the uh, the Doom trilogy. Yeah, we thought it good to mention. You know, Tolkien didn't always make the same distinguishment that we did between we did. curses, prophecies, and oaths explicitly. They all kind of overlapped. For example, like the Doom of Mandos is technically both a curse and a prophecy. Uh, its other names, like we mentioned before, are the Doom of the Noldor, the Curse of Mandos, or the Prophecy of the North. So it's, Look at all those buzzwords in yeah, there. Yeah, we decided to cover that one under Prophecies, but it does overlap. Yeah, and of course the Oath of Feanor and the Doom of Mandos kind of go hand in hand as well. Yeah, even though they're separate, they do kind of you know deal with each other. They overlap. And yeah. another example, Felagun's Oath to Bear here. And then Felagun's prophecy, prophecy about ab- that oath. About the friggin' oath. Yeah, there's a lot of overlapping here. Um, how about Hurin's uh, oath to keep secret the location of Gondolin and Hurin's intentional breaking, or unintentional, rather, breaking of that oath due to the curse of the House of Ador. Yeah, that curse. An oath broken by a curse. Yeah, it wasn't really his intention, but they're definitely related. Then there's, of course, there's Gollum's oath on the ring, and then Frodo Faramir's curses on Gollum. If you were to break that oath, again, these curses and oaths are kind of intertwined. Mm-hmm. Melian's prophecy that the quest of the Silmaril will entwine them in the Oath of Feanor. She's the only one that pretty much explicitly says this shit goes on. Right. And then, of course, Melian's other prophecy about the curse on the Blade Anglical. So, you know, on the Blade Anglical. So, a prophecy about a curse, you know. Yeah, and this the curse blade is, like, not the main curse in the Children of Hurin, but it is a synergetic curse. Yeah, it adds even more yeah. to the curses going on there. It's, yeah. you know, adds a little flavor. Add a little flavor. Boom. Yeah, so like we said, you know, Tolkien didn't always make 
didn't didn't distinguish explicitly between curses, oaths, and prophecies like we did. Yeah. But we thought it would be a great way to kind of break down Tolkien's concept of doom in three parts. In and three um, parts. Yeah. And we we are so thankful that you listened to all of this. Yes, we had a lot of fun with this Doom trilogy, and we're really happy and we're <laughs> we're really proud of it. And I must say, yeah, we busted our asses on this one. The last few weeks have been rough. But, but it's been totally it's worth it. This off. has been this has been so much fun. Yeah, we hope you guys love these episodes as much as we did. But that's all we've got for you today, guys. Thanks again for listening to KOT Podcast. Uh, don't forget to follow us on social follow us on social media. You can follow us on Twitter at KOT Podcast. Or if you want to follow Mr. Danny, you can follow him at Danny J at KOT. Um, follow us on Facebook, www.facebook.com slash official keep on Tolkien. And also join that KOT talk group to ask us questions and discuss with other listeners. Follow us on Instagram at keep on Tolkien podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to wherever you get your podcasts on Spotify, SoundCloud, or iTunes. And of course, also make sure to hit us up on uh, Discord. Um, we um, we have the Discord channel. It's very fun. We p- we play around with everybody out there a lot. Yeah, we spend a lot of time on Discord, especially after the pandemic. It's kind of yeah. where we live our lives now. Yeah. So we we've already posted uh, links to it a few times. But if you don't, if you can't find one, um, just hit us up. We'll send you one. And of course, thank you, thank you, thank you to our patrons on Patreon. Our heroes. You are our heroes. Um, and if you feel like uh. Uh, subscribing to give to the patreon that's uh, www.patreon.com slash kot podcast yeah subscribe and you can go ahead and support us as we've mentioned before it's really because of our patrons that we were even able to bring this season to you this 100%. season 100 percent, 100 percent, because the kot is still a diy podcast we don't make anything off of it uh, and so all the uh, donations you guys send us they, they really help it really helps us keep going yeah and it also helps us bring great content to you at the same level quality level and uh, subscribing on patreon can also get you some exclusive content that's pretty fun yeah and also we've also been having uh people ask us about private one-time donations if uh, patreon really isn't your speed the subscription service and we do definitely accept private one-time donations just shoot us an email or a message on social media we'll make it happen with paypal or something similar absolutely but that's all we've got for you today guys i'm danny J, and i'm joel and and as always Keep Keep on on Tolkien. So this was a very exhausting week for us, guys. So I'm just going to kind of... Oh, Ray.